Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Mark Steiner. Great to have you all with us. Last weekend, at least a quarter of a million people protested in Prague, the capital of the Czech Republic. It was the largest demonstration since the Velvet Revolution of 1989. The protests called on the Prime Minister of the Czech Republic, Andrzej Babish, to resign over allegations of corruption. Babish is the second richest man in the, in the Czech Republic. He's the sole owner of Agrofert Group, which owns Czech newspapers as well as agriculture, food, chemical, construction, logistics, forestry, and energy companies operating throughout Europe and in China. The Czech police, as well as European anti-fraud police, have investigated Babish and pressed charges against him for allegedly receiving an unlawful subsidy from the European Union to his company by using his connections as a politician. But as prime minister, he enjoys immunity and cannot be brought to justice. And let me add this. This is from a man who is a Euroskeptic, who hates the European Union, just likes making money off of it. This, in part, is why people are staging massive protests in Prague. One of the protesters spoke to Time magazine. I'm here because I don't want our prime minister, Andrei Babish, to be the prime minister of the Czech Republic. And that is because I think things like democracy, transparency, uh, independent justice, and honesty on a whole are very important. And he does not. That's why I'm here, because I don't want him as our prime minister. And we are joined by Professor Petr Hust, who is chair of the Department of Political Science and Humanities at the Metropolitan University of Prague. And Petr, welcome. Good to have you with us here. Good evening from Prague and good afternoon to Good to US. have you here. So, so talk a bit about what happened here. I heard about these protests actually firsthand from one of our producers, a visual producer, uh, Andrew Corkery, who was just in Prague. And we're some of the photos we're going to see in a while of once he took of the demonstration itself, like that one. Um, and so, but talk about why the protests erupted now. I mean, the police recommended indicting him for fraud in April. So why, what's, what's erupting now and what's the connection? So this is not the first time the protests against Andrei Babish are happening in Prague. We can remember some of the protests last year, the year before, uh, usually connected with some of the anniversaries, of national holidays of, or the ne November 17th uh, anniversary. But the situation we are facing right now, or the situation which is different right now from the previous ones, is that uh, there are not only uh, some national domestic issues that Andrei Babish is facing, uh, but there are also issues connected with the European Union. There, uh, there are the audits from the European Union coming to Czech Republic, and they are allegedly referring to Andrei Babish uh, as the person who violates the conf or who has the conflict of interest and therefore violates both domestic but also European law. Uh, so all these situations today, they are just complementing what we already know about Andrei Babish and what has been a reason for protests also in the past years. I'm curious, just for all of our edifications as we're watching this, I mean, the, what the political situation is in the Czech Republic. I mean, what's the source of Babish's strength? I mean, he's, he's been fired, removed in an unconfidence vote. His immunity is stripped by the parliament. He keeps coming back as prime minister and leader. Um, there seems to be a real split from uh, between rural and urban. So talk a bit about wh what's actually happening. What, 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 why, is, why, is, why is what we're seeing happening well, now? Could, this, this would be issue. This would be issue for the dissertation uh, work, so it's not an easy to answer in few minutes what are the sources of Babish's uh, power or Babish's uh -huh. success. But we can we can mention few of them. Okay. Uh, definitely, we, we witnessed a so-called crisis of traditional political parties. Uh, the Czech party system has been quite stable when it comes to, for example, a number of political parties. Uh, that were at power since 1989 or since early 1990s. But of course, the more you are at power, uh, the more you have a tendency to misuse the power. So many of the political parties that were at power since 1990s, they started to lose the trust of the people. And this uh, opened the space for new movements. Usually we talk about the protest movements, populist movements, or sometimes even anti-establishment movements who are uh, trying to challenge the long time rulers, but long time in, in a Czech context means from the, the early 1990s since, since the party system has just, has, uh, just uh, uh, became a competitive uh, just after the fall of 
after the fall of communism. So the, the, the collapse of the traditional parties, collapse of the public trust in traditional parties, traditional right-wing, traditional left-wing parties, uh, brought to power Andrei Babish uh, with his movement. The, the movement is uh, called ANO, which is abbreviation of the word action of dissatisfied citizens. So mm -hmm. even the, the name of the movement is supposed to uh, reflect that it's a kind of public, uh, I would say in quotes, uprising against traditional parties. But in fact, despite the name, despite the title action of dissatisfied citizens, it's a, it's a uh, very centralized movement uh, built by Andrei Babish and uh, very, very much influenced just by this one person. It's definitely not bottom top uh, movement, but top down movement. Uh, and Andrei Babish built this movement without any ideological framing. Uh, he feels that the people are not much interested in ideology. They are not much interested whether the party uh, claims or labels itself as conservative, liberal, or socialistic. The people usually have a tendency to see the things done. And Andrei Babish, he used his experience from, from the business and he built his political uh, political uh, career around uh, giving a people feeling that he comes to solve the daily issues, not to uh, discuss whether conservative or liberal approach is better. He just comes to make the things things done, and that's that's the basic line for him. So, if you would, for example, ask what is the ideological profile of the ANO movement or the ANO party, there is no one simple question. He picks up uh, the, the topics and issues everywhere around the left-right scale, and he's very much uh, flexible uh, in, from this point of view. Well, I'm, I'm curious, though, he's also been accused of being a former member of the Communist Party's secret police in Czechoslovakia um, uh, when the Soviet Union was in control. And although he, he represents, but he represents all these capitalist interests, you, which you were beginning to explain to us after the last question. So, I mean, how is it possible that he's like the, the, the first prime minister uh, after the fall of communism, whose government supported by the Communist Party itself? And so, if, could you parse it out a bit more for us? I mean, what exactly is this alignment? It seems when I when I read about this, I'm seeing that the opposition is everything from classic European liberals to to uh, young radicals on the left. So, I mean, it's a very interesting kind of spread mm. of parties. It's, it's not what we usually expect. Mm. Uh, I don't think that the support of the Communist Party has something to do with the fact that Andrei Babish himself is a former member of the Communist Party. Many former members of Communist parties got, uh, got uh, distributed all over the left-right scale uh, after 1989. Uh, Andrei Babish was seeking, uh, after 2017 elections, Andrei Babish was seeking to get support. And I would really say from anyone who would be able to give him the support, who give him the confidence and support uh, his uh, administration, uh, because uh, he won the elections. But since Czech Republic has proportional system, it's very rare in such systems, proportional electoral system, and it's very rare in proportional electoral systems that a winning party holds majority itself in, in a legislature. So Andrei Babish won the elections, won with approximately 30% of votes, but did not get majority uh, and therefore had to seek some support from other parties. He made up the coalition with the Social Democrats and they negotiated the support from the Communist Party and there was an exchange for some uh, program uh, uh, issues that the Communist Party wanted to uh, wanted to uh, move forward. So there were some some issues where uh, Andrei Babiš, uh, Social Democrats, and the Communists were able to agree on. Usually like these uh, usually they are issues like uh, the uh, not uh, not uh, putting any more burden financial burden on people. Uh, when paying, the, when uh, uh, trying to get the health care, because health care and paid health care and free health care, uh, that's been a very big issue already in, in, a, in the 2000s when the right wing governments were, were, uh, were adopting the fees that people were, we people were paying at the doctors, which was something like a revolutionary, because in uh, all the post communist countries, usually there is still the 
the tradition of free health care or, or, or at least the basic health care. So then came the left wing governments that abolished these fees. And Andrei Babish, from this point of view, is also acting more like a left wing politician. Uh, there, there was. So, okay, finish your saying. I'm sorry. Uh, go, go ahead. Uh, there, there was another issue. Uh, there were the restitutions of the church property, the restitutions that the Communist Party, all of the property that the Communist Party before 1989 uh, took from the churches. So uh, it's been returned to churches uh, quite recently. But now, of course, the left wing parties are uh, challenging this uh, restitution of right. the church property. And they all, the three parties, the two coalition parties plus the communist one that's supporting uh, this coalition, they agreed on, on uh, uh, giving an extra tax to churches so that they would pay from the property they got. So at least the state would have something from, from uh, these restitutions yes. into the state budget. So my, this, this in some ways to me is where I think a lot of confusion of the present moment politically takes place not just in Czechoslovakia, but around the world. I mean, um, because some of the populist rhetoric that's being used in, in Czech Republic and across Europe and in the United States and in Brazil and in Philippines is kind of left-wing rhetoric um, mm. run by kind of billionaire leaders who are right-wing populist. And so I'm curious, I mean, so, you know, we have Trump in the United States, you've got uh, Orban, you've got all the others around the world. So what's Babish's role in this kind of, uh, with this alliance of alt-right leaders, and how does that fit into everything? Well, he's sometimes described as Czech Trump, but uh, of course the situation is a little bit different uh, because of the, uh, the position that uh, the president of the U.S. has in the U.S. political system and the prime minister of the Czech Republic has in the Czech, uh, Czech political system, uh, they are more compared just be, uh, as for being the two businessmen who entered the politics and who are using their, their uh, um, experiences from business to run the state. Uh, Andrei Babiš himself claims that he came to the politics to run the state as he ran his businesses. Uh, so this is probably the common issue that all these um, entrepreneurs and businessmen who enter the politics have. Uh, I, am, I, I think that uh, Andrei Babish is of those who you, you named, actually, as the other examples. I think Andrei Babish is the least ideologically oriented one. So but while- Hasn't he kind of we, complained about immigration, immigrants coming to, Czech, to the Czech Republic? Yeah, when but, that's really not a huge issue for the Czech Republic. Right? Well, yeah, there are none, non immigrants in Czech Republic, but it's still a big issue because it's, uh, it's always catchy for the people. Uh, people will probably, uh, people will likely uh, uh, understand the issues uh, that they actually never never experience because they cannot prove whether the politicians are actually right or wrong in this so it's uh, it's a common technique uh, that you uh, as uh, that, that that you claim that there is some threat and you claim that you came actually to save the people from the threat and that's it exactly what's happening around, uh, around migration right. issues in some of the countries. Uh, not in all of the countries. Of course, Hungary has completely different experience with the migration because they are on the southern border of the Schengen area, so they are facing much uh, more critical uh, situations when it comes to migration uh, situation. But for example, Czech Republic, which is a landlocked country, but not only landlocked without the access to the sea, but also landlocked when we take it from the right. perspective of the external border of the European Union. So Hungary is also landlocked without the access to the sea, but it's on the external border of the European Union, of the Schengen area. But in Czech Republic, there is no, not, not much this an issue, but still people, ta people take it seriously and the politicians, uh, and not only Andrei Babiš, also, the president Miloš Zeman, or the leader of uh, one of the extreme right-wing party, the SPD, the Freedom and Direct Democracy, Mr. Tomi Okamura, they are using this issue, this migration issue, to get votes and to claim that they will save people from uh, from the migrants and they will save Czech Republic from Islamization and and similar issues. Well, Petro Yus, thank you so much for taking your time with us this evening in Czechoslovakia. 
Uh, I mean, Czech Republic, excuse me, I keep doing that. I'm, so, I'll call it a certain age, it's still in my head, I have to get it out. But thank you so much. It's nice, it's actually, I, I was born in Czechoslovakia, so I consider Czechoslovakia to be my home country. Although we are close to Czech Republic and Slovakia, but I still feel Czechoslovakian, so it was no hope. I don't feel so bad. So, uh, Petr, Petr Jus, thank you so much. It's been great to talk to you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye. And I'm Mark Steiner here for The Real News Network. Thank you all for watching. Take care.